Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Penn State University Park. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, the session where undergraduate admissions is partnering with housing and food services. My name is Kate and I'm part of the undergraduate admissions team at Penn State University Park. It is my pleasure to welcome you into this great session today. We're really looking forward to spending some time with you and getting you all of the information that you need to know about the live on experience at University Park. Just a few housekeeping items before we go ahead and get started with this session. This session will last about one hour. So probably the first half of the session will be informational. It'll be a, a presentation. And the second half will be live Q&A. So you'll have the opportunity to submit questions to us. We do have a number of panelists and admissions counselors behind the scenes who are able to answer your questions. So you should see a Q&A icon at the very bottom of your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A and we'll get answers to you. Keep in mind though, our presenter Jennifer will probably cover a lot of information today and a lot of the questions that you may have, she'll probably touch on some information about those questions. So. You may want to hang tight to your questions until she's covered all of that information. But if there is something that is really pressing, please feel free to submit those questions at any time and we'll, we'll get answers to them uh, right away. Um, I think that is, that's about it um, at this point. So what I'd like to do is open things up and hand things off to uh, Jennifer Garvin. Go ahead and take it from here. All right. Thanks, Kate. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Jennifer. I am with Housing and Food Services. So I am very excited to be here today to talk to you about the Live On experience. Um, housing and food, uh, there's a lot of information, a lot of details. So I will definitely try to get through all of this. And um, again, hopefully I'll be able to answer all your questions. But as Kate mentioned, uh, we will have that Q&A at the end if there was something I didn't touch on and you wanted to learn more. Let's talk about what uh, living on campus looks like for students, um, and this is primarily for University Park. Um, so if you have a specific ca uh, campus question, just, just, uh, we can cover those in the Q&A. So at University Park, uh, we house approximately 14,000 students. Um, of course, our capacity can vary year to year, but that is our, our average number of students who live on campus. Uh, for first year students, we have five different housing areas where students can live, and that includes uh, various housing options, which we'll get into. Um, we'll also talk about uh, special living options that students can opt into, what amenities that you should expect uh, while living on campus, and then we're going to talk about campus dining. So that's kind of what we're going to cover today. So um, again, at University Park, we house about 14,000 students. Uh, first year students, there is a residency requirement. So all students who are offered admission are expected to live on campus. Um, we do have a few exemptions from that policy. So students who have graduated from a uh, center county high school can exempt or students who are over the age of 21 or if they have dependents. Um, so we can work with those students if you happen to fall into that uh, category. Um, and because of this residency requirement, we guarantee you a space on campus. So you don't have to worry about us running out of rooms for you. We will be able to house you. Um, for transfer students, uh, we do have a limited reserve space. So those transfer students who want uh, to live on um, will have that opportunity to do so. And then beyond your first year, uh, you will be classified as an upper class student. Uh, so you will be able to participate in a request process and you can live on campus uh, for as many years as you want to. So all students who want to live on campus beyond their first year uh, will be able to do so. Um, so I just want to make sure I clarify that because uh, when you're here as a first year student, we'll start talking about uh, upper class students and you're technically then considered upper class for the following year. So um, who lives on campus? So again, all first year students, uh, we house approximately 8,000 first year students. And then the next largest population are sophomores, followed by juniors and seniors. Um, we have even had super seniors who lived on campus uh, for five or six years. So some people really enjoy the convenience, the amenities that are offered, and um, have opted to live on campus all four years. Um, so again, it, it's available for those students who want to do that. So you can see a map of University Park just to kind of outline 
um, the different housing areas where uh, students live. Some of these areas that are highlighted, um, there's, there's a couple that are just for upper class. Um, but you know, we named them appropriately east, west, north, south, and then Pollock is kind of in the middle, um, just to help students understand where approximately on campus these housing areas are. Um, I do want to point out, though, as a first year student, you are taking, uh, you know, general education classes, you won't be taking major level classes, so you're going to be all over campus with your classes. One housing area will not get you closer to your classes, and you have to remember you switch your uh, schedule for spring semester, so you could be in a completely different um, you know, uh, layout for your classes for the spring. Um, so some students, you know, they want to wait till they see what their schedule looks like to get them closest, and it just doesn't happen that way. So um, don't don't worry about that. Uh, we also have a fabulous uh, bus system to help students get around campus um, so that they will never be far from where they need to get. So for the uh, first year students, um, we have, again, the five areas. There are approximately 4,000 first year students who live in East, 2,000 in Pollock, uh, 900 in South, 750 in North, and West is 600. There is a myth that all first-year students live in East. Only first-year students live in East, but it's only half of the first-year population. So first-year students are in all of these other areas. Um, the, um, and you can see by the numbers, obviously those other four areas are just smaller in overall capacity, which is why there are less first-year students. No matter where you live, you will be with other first year students. You will have ex, um, the same programming opportunities. And we don't want students to feel that they're gonna miss out on something if they're not in East. Um, your experience living on campus is what you make of it. Your housing area is not going to improve your experience. It's about you. So if you're not assigned to East, you are still going to have a great experience. So please keep that in mind. And then, as I mentioned, we do have upper class students who live on campus and we have expanded opportunities for those students. We have um, additional apartments as well as a single room availability for students. So let's talk about the housing options that are available for first year students. Um, we have uh, traditional residence halls. That is the majority of our space for first year students. We also have limited renovated residence halls. A renovated residence hall is um, a traditional building that we have gone into and obviously made some updates and improved some of the amenities that we're offering to students. Um, we um, have been in a project to uh, renovate all of East and then move down and renovate all of Pollock. Um, we were about halfway through that plan when the COVID pandemic hit um, and we had to halt our project. So East has um, 10 buildings that are renovated, six unrenovated buildings. Um, we are expecting to restart that project uh, next year. And so um, we will complete three more buildings in East and then um, move down to Pollock. And we should now be wrapped up by 2028. Um, so I just wanna make sure that folks understand um, renovated residence halls are very limited for students. And so um, it is our most popular requested housing preference, but not our most common room type. So not all students will be able to get into that space. We also have suites. Suites are located in North and a suite is two students in a room, four students in a suite and they share a bathroom. So it's a four person suite. Um, the room types that we have, we do have, most of them are doubles. We do offer limited singles. Uh, single rooms are available in um, West, South, and Pollock. There are no singles in the East Halls area. So if you would like to request a single, uh, please be aware that you may not be assigned to one in East. We also have triple rooms and quads. So with the COVID pandemic, uh, we decided to reduce our uh, room capacity. So all these rooms were set at a cap capacity of two. So for triple rooms, we were only putting in two. Um, a quad is a large room, one room that has a space for four students, whereas a suite is for four students, but it's two bedrooms. So it's a little bit different. There's not an in-bath, uh, in-room bath in a quad. Um, so for this coming year, uh, we were just uh, told that we are able to increase some of those capacities. 
So we will be offering triples and quads, but it's only for students who mutually request each other. So we will not assign anybody to a triple unless they have listed two other students and it's, it's a pod. Um, so if you put a triple, but you don't have roommate requests, we probably won't assign you to the triple. Um, we only want those uh, friend groups to be in those spaces. And then I've listed a uh, supplemental housing. Uh, supplemental housing is our overflow. So, you know, we have so many spaces reserved and with the admissions process, we tend to have more students accept that offer of admission, but we know that there's a melt that students will change their mind and not come to Penn State. Um, so because of that, that uh, change, uh, we use uh, what we call supplemental, again, kind of like overflow to help uh, put students in a room and then we move them out. Uh, so last year we did not utilize any of our supplemental housing rooms. Uh, currently, our plan is to not use those spaces, um, but depending on requests and um, what we can offer to students, uh, some students may end up being assigned to one of our SUP rooms that's in a renovated residence hall. They're actually more like a quad. Um, they're actually beautiful space. So some students, we may provide that option to them um, and not use our larger SUP rooms that we have historically used on campus. So I just wanted to show you a couple pictures. Um, to see what our spaces look like. So this is a traditional residence hall. And in our traditional spaces, um, they're pretty much set up in East. They're an e, um, a left-right configuration, built-in furniture. Um, so you really don't have a lot of flexibility in moving those around, but students have designated space. So we provide the dresser, the, the uh, desk. Um, and then in Pollock, um, it is a L-shaped configuration. Although um, in this picture, um, the young ladies in this room decided to put their beds kind of side by side, um, but it is uh, all the furniture is on one side of the room and the beds are on the other side. In our renovated residence hall, this is a picture of Earl Hall. It's actually a, a new building that we built several years ago uh, to help us uh, keep our occupancy level where we need it to be during our renovation project. So in our renovated spaces, uh, the furniture is different. None of it is built in. Um, and so students have a little bit more flexibility on how they set up their room. And um, our bathrooms are a little bit different in a uh, renovated residence halls. We offer individual pods. You go into the bathroom, you're the only one in that space. And um, so you have it to yourself, but you can use any bathroom on the floor that's available. In our traditional halls, they are communal bathrooms. Um, so you have, uh, you know, a row of sinks, but the showers are private and the bathroom stalls are private. So you still have some privacy, but you might be brushing your teeth next to somebody. And then I mentioned our suites. So in North Halls, we have those suites. And um, again, it's at two persons in a bedroom and it has a uh, shared bathroom, a, a bathroom that's available in, this, in the space. And then there's a little uh, walk-in room when you first come into the suite. Um, it's not quite a living room, um, but it's enough for, for two chairs and a place for students to hang out. And then uh, this is another picture of a different suite that we have on campus. So again, uh, three options for students to select from for their first year. So let's talk about the amenities that we have available for students. Uh, Penn State will provide you with a micro fridge that is a microwave, freezer fridge combo unit. It is a special unit um, that we utilize because of concerns with uh, voltage and, and we don't want to trip breakers. So we provide this to students. Therefore, you do not need to bring one. We ask you not to bring one. We'll make you take it home um, because we want to be make sure that we're not overloading our circuits. Um, we also provide a security system. So all of our buildings are locked 24 hours a day and you have a, you use your Penn State ID card to gain access into those buildings. Um, we do offer video surveillance in public areas. So not on your floor or around bathrooms. Um, so if there's something that does happen, we have the capacity to go back and, and review that. Um, we also have auxiliary police officers who will patrol the outside of our buildings um, during um, the evenings and overnight to make sure that all of our security systems are working. Um, there's no broken doors, no broken windows. If they notice a light out, um, they can call it in so that we can keep all these areas well lit and safe for students. And the housing areas also include emergency phones. Um, so you can, um, if, if, if you're walking and you need assistance, you can go to the emergency light and call for police services. And the university also offers a safe 
walk uh, service. So if you do not feel comfortable walking back from say a, a, an academic building, you can call for an escort and they will either walk with you, behind you, uh, to make you feel comfortable walking across campus late at night. Uh, we have, uh, of course, a laundry facilities in all of our buildings. Um, depending on the building, it's either one central laundry room or it might be smaller laundry rooms spread out in the building. Um, we only accept Lion Cash for payment, so no coins. And um, so we can talk about Lion Cash in a little bit, but they're all high efficiency machines. Uh, we have a contract with a company who maintains these and makes sure that they're all working properly uh, for students. And uh, so this is a good time to tell you to learn how to do laundry. Um, and I will say the most popular night to do laundry is Sunday. So um, you may not find a washer and dryer that day. Um, sorry, I'm kidding. But um, and then, of course, in our in our buildings, we offer um, Penn State Wi-Fi service. Um, we do not have Ethernet connections any longer. So we have ramped up the, the Wi-Fi service for students, um, students who need to get on uh, an Ethernet connection. Um, all of the residence areas have a computer lab available to you in the commons building or in a building next door. Um, so you can go to the computer lab. They're open 24 hours a day. You can print there. So you don't necessarily have to bring a printer, um, but you, you can certainly opt to do that. And we have um, a system called Room Gear where you can connect all of your devices. So if you are a gamer, um, if you bring a printer, um, whatever you have, you'll be able to connect through our wireless system. Um, and we have lots of recreational opportunities for students. So this is a hammock grove that we just installed in the East Halls area. And uh, we will be expanding that program and putting those across campus. And of course we have basketball courts, volleyball courts, um, and we have recreational equipment that you can sign out at the Commons desk. You also get a lot of questions about storage. Um, so the university does not offer on-site storage options for students uh, just because of, of other things that we're doing with maintenance, conferences. Um, we are not able to keep students' personal belongings. Um, so we have a company that we work with called Storage Squad, and um, you can contract with them and they will come in and uh, they provide free boxes and then they will store your items um, between, say, the end of spring to fall semester, um, and they'll, they'll drop it off before you get back. So a really great service for students who may be um, not from the United States or uh, you know, they're, they're out of state, um, or you just have a lot of stuff and you don't wanna take home. So that is available for students. If you're coming for summer, and uh, we will provide information on what you can do with your items between summer and fall. Uh, we don't wanna see you lug everything home and have to bring it back either, because uh, that just uh, slows down the arrival process. So there will be opportunities for you to temporarily store your items between um, that transition. So we'll provide those details at a later time. And of course, a, a great amenity is all of the programming opportunities that are available from uh, not only our residence life staff, but other departments across campus. So we get a lot of questions. Um, what to bring? What do I leave at home? Um, these are outlined in the terms, conditions, and regulations of your housing and food service contract. Um, but a quicker way to find that is if you go to our arrival website, um, this has a, a quick list of those items, what to leave. Uh, we don't allow candles, incense uh, for fire safety hazards, um, no kitchen appliances, you know, uh, no rice cookers, uh, anything like that. Um, we need to be cautious of fire safety, uh, so we do not allow those types of appliances. Please, no toasters. Um, we get, uh, we've had numerous issues with, um, quote, illegal toasters. Um, so I wanted to talk about a special living option. So a special living option is um, a program that we offer as an option for students. They have a very specific focus. And uh, it's basically a space in a residence hall where students are assigned together. In parentheses, you'll see I have living learning community. So we are uh, transitioning our language from special living options to living learning community. A living learning community or an LLC is a more common language used across numerous universities and colleges. Um, we were kind of the exception. So we're gonna be transitioning over to that. Uh, so that people who are looking at different universities can see like for like. Um, but again, a special living option, um, we have 23 options for first year students. Um, some examples include engineering house, uh, business and society. Uh, we have liberal arts, education, 
Uh, we have the Discover House. So students who are undecided can opt to live in the Discover House. And they offer programming to help students explore all the majors that are available at Penn State to help them pick the right major for the career path that they want to that they want to pursue. So um, again, a special living option is not a requirement, um, but students find a benefit because there's some additional programming that's offered to those students. So they might bring in a faculty person to present a program. They might have um, field trips. Um, they have community events. So again, it's an additional layer for students. So I, I would um, uh, recommend to students at least explore what's available for you and see if anything is of interest. But again, it's not a requirement. I also wanted to mention gender inclusive housing. Uh, we are extremely sensitive to students who may fall into this category. And if you need any assistance related to your room assignment, I will work with you personally one-on-one -on -one to find the right room assignment for you. Uh, we wanna make sure that all students feel safe and comfortable in their living environment. And uh, we would like to work with them um, on that personal level um, because each student has different needs. So if you fall into that category, uh, please reach out to me. I'm happy to work with you to discuss what options are available. So we wanna talk about the housing assignment process. Um, historically, the university has followed a first come first serve housing process for incoming first year students. Um, but this coming fall is the first time that we're changing that uh, policy. Uh, so we will be processing room assignments in random order. So what does that mean? That means um, we don't look at when you accepted that offer of admission. Um, students, when we get to you in that random process, if your um, preferences that you indicated, if it's available, we will assign you. If it's not available, we will assign you to your second preference if that's available. And if not, we'll have to assign you to another available space. Um, so again, we do not guarantee housing preferences. It is a preference. It is not um, something that we are obligated or able to accommodate everybody. As I mentioned earlier, our most common housing preference is the double room renovated. And we just simply do not have enough space to accommodate everybody who wants to live there. So I would recommend that when you are listing your housing preferences, that uh, you don't put the same thing twice. Don't put East Hall's reno double renovated, East Hall's double renovated. Um, because if that option is not available, we don't know where your second preference may be. So you would need to put something different as your second preference that you would be happy with. Again, I can't guarantee that we'd be able to assign you, but having that helps the assignment office staff uh, really manage uh, the assignments a little bit better. So we're gonna talk about roommates. Um, so you'll notice when you go through your housing contract, we do not ask you any questions about yourself. Do you get up early? Do you stay um, you know, up late? Um, are you neat? Um, because matching people based on those types of questions does not mean that you would have a better roommate experience. We do not wanna set you up for a false expectation. So therefore we have a random uh, a room assignment process. We value diversity. We want you to meet somebody who's different from yourself to learn, to, to grow, and to interact with these with students. This is part of the uh, college experience and, and growing. Um, you do have the uh, opportunity to list a roommate as a preference. So if you do that, um, it has to be mutual. And um, since this is our first year with this new room assignment process, we're pretty confident that we should be able to accommodate roommate requests together. Um, but uh, unless there's some odd reason that we couldn't do that. But again, we may not get your preferences, but at least we can get roommates together. Um, on a personal note, I would, I would almost recommend that uh, you don't list somebody that you know, um, because you, know, you need to live with somebody. You don't need to be best friends with the person that you live with. And it's almost better that you know somebody who lives somewhere else, so you have somewhere to go. Um, you and your building might meet a group of people and have uh, meet some new friends, and then your, your friend that you know could be in another building, and then you go visit them, and they're introducing you to more people. So you can actually expand your uh, friend base uh, larger by having your friends not be in the same space as you. Some people don't like that. I totally respect that, but I always like to offer that out as a suggestion um, that it's sometimes better not to live with your best friend. Um, that way you have your own space that you, you know, you, you have your time. I do want to um, recommend that we do offer housing accommodations for students with medical needs. 
So if, if you um, have a need, uh, we have a, a formal process that uh, you fill out paperwork so we can make that accommodation for you. And then I have here listed eBoard. So um, as I mentioned, you know, we can't always guarantee those preferences. Um, preferences you can list up until noon on May 15th. But after that, we are not able to uh, make any changes to those preferences. We actually extract that information from the system and our assignment coordinators start working on them. So um, there's no way to update it that they would get that new information. So what we've done instead was we created the Room Exchange eBoard. In eLiving, when you see your room assignment for fall or for summer, uh, you would be able to use the eBoard and you can switch your room assignment with somebody else. So if I really wanted to live with a particular person and I found them after that May 15 deadline, I can request a room switch with their roommate for us to try to be together. Or if I'm assigned to East and I really wanted to be in North, I can put myself on the e-board and then process a switch with somebody who might be interested in changing rooms. So this gives students the opportunity to modify their assignment without having the housing assignment office assist them. So we'll provide information about that during the process when that's available. So I'm gonna switch really quickly and uh, talk a little bit about campus dining so you can understand what to expect. Um, so again, we're, we're Penn State proud at um, University Park. Uh, we um, oversee all of our operations. They're all in-house with the exception of like three operations. So everybody who serves you is a Penn State employee. Uh, we have over 30 operations available on campus. So you will be able to eat anywhere that you want with your campus meal plan. Um, so you don't have to stay within the housing area where you live. Um, so we have convenience stores. Our new convenience stores also offer a market. So we have fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, and you can kind of see in this picture in the background, um, a lot of uh, product that students you, you could normally expect in a grocery store. Uh, we brought that on site. So it's not just junk food. Um, there are a lot of great products available for you to use your uh, meal plan at. Uh, we also have the uh, Edge uh, coffee bars across campus, as well as Starbucks. So if you love coffee, you, you'll be able to get your fill. Um, we also have some branded concepts available on campus. Um, so in the hub, we have McAllister's. Um, we're going to uh, introduce Slim Chickens this fall. So very excited to see that. Uh, we have Burger King and we have Panera. So some great opportunities, uh, options for students. Um, we also offer Pure. Uh, Pure is a concept that's available. Um, it's in East Halls. It is a kosher certified facility, and it serves menu items that are free from the eight most common allergens. So uh, a really great option for students, and they're available for lunch and dinner. And, and again, any student can eat there. We also have registered dietitians on staff. So this is Katie and Lauren. They will work with you personally, again, one-on-one -on -one to go over any concerns um, that you have. Um, they'll introduce you to staff. They'll show you how to navigate our menu um, and how to order food in advance um, so that, again, you can eat safely on campus and have that variety that you need. Uh, we also offer gluten-free options in each of the five dining commons. Um, so you, you know that you can go there and have that product available. And again, we have a huge rotation of menu items available for students. Um, so I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about the campus meal plan. Um, I feel like this is always very complicated to explain, um, but it's super easy to use. Um, so the campus meal plan is a declining account balance. Um, we put funds on your student ID card, and then when you go make a purchase, you present your ID card and we deduct it, kind of like um, a debit card or a checking account. We have one campus meal plan, but there are three different levels available. And again, this is a very flexible plan. So if you go away for the weekend, uh, we don't charge you anything for that. Um, when you look at the rates for the meal plan, and uh, these rates listed were for this past year. Um, so I apologize that I did not uh, update this for this coming year. So please uh, take that into, into mind. Um, but again, you can see that when you're looking at this chart, that there's two cost components to the campus meal plan. So the base cost is paid upfront by each student. 
And that money goes to food services. And they basically use those funds to be open all semester. They use that to pay for um, overhead, labor, uh, supplies, utilities, et cetera. And then what's left are dining dollars. And those are the funds that will be on your account that you will use to make purchases with. Now you may look at that and say, that's not a lot of money to make purchases with. Um, but we're gonna talk about the discount structure that we offer to students who live on campus. When you accept your meal plan, it defaults to level two. Um, you have the ability to increase or decrease that level up until the last day of finals. Um, my recommendation, either leave it at two or drop it to a one. It's better to have lower than the higher one. Um, but again, you have the flexibility to change that at any time, provided um, once you get into the semester and start using it, though, you can't drop to a lower level if you don't have the funds available to drop. So if you use your dining dollars and they're not there, you can't drop your meal plan. So let's talk about discounts um, because you paid that base cost up front. We want to make sure that we don't overcharge you because you paid for overhead labor, all those items. So when you go to make your purchases, we discount it. So if you go to the dining commons, you're going to pay a set meal price. When I go for lunch, my cost is $11.95 because I didn't pay that base cost. But the student, their lunch um, fee may only be like $4.25. You're essentially only paying the food cost for that meal because you paid that base cost up front. So we're discounting your meal price from the cash price. If you go to a residential operation, um, you will get a 65% discount off of the cash price so you're only, again, paying for the food cost. Um, again, if I go purchase something, I'm paying that full menu item. So um, and, and don't quote me, I'm going to do my math here, and I'm always terrible at doing this on the fly. But if, a, um, if it's a $2 uh, order of French fries, I pay $2, you might pay 70 cents, whatever the 65% off. So again, you're paying a discounted structure. So those discounts help stretch your dining dollars uh, go longer. Um, so if you go to the hub dining, as I mentioned, we have some nationally branded concepts. So in those locations, you um, are not able to receive a discount, but you can use your meal plan. Um, they do have some operations that they offer 10% off of the items that they make. So if you, if you kind of get the gist from this, you get the best discount if you eat where you live. So if you go into academic buildings, you're going to pay more for where you're eating because it's not attached to your living area. We also allow you to use your campus meal plan at the Creamery, at the Bryce Jordan Center, Beaver Stadium, and Pagula. Uh, you would not receive a discount off of those purchases, but you can still use your meal plan. So if you're here for summer, any uh, balance with your dining dollars will carry over to fall. Your fall balance carries over to spring, but at the end of spring semester, anything that you have left is forfeited. So this is why I recommend that you always have a lower plan. Um, it is better to actually run out of dining dollars than to have too many because we will not refund those dining dollars. So go lower. And the reason why I say that is our system has a great benefit that if you have a low balance um, and you have funds in your Lion Cash account, then we will have um, a, a process that the, the register will transfer funds from Lion Cash um, to your meal plan and still provide you that same deep discount. So let me explain what Lion Cash is. Lion Cash is a secondary account that's on your Penn State ID card. Um, you'll use Lion Cash to um, do laundry, printing and vending costs across campus. And then we also have about 200 merchants that accept Lion Cash for payment. So it's kind of like a debit card. Um, you can go to the bookstore um, and make uh, purchases. If you wanted to go downtown and go to McDonald's for the night, uh, you can use Lion Cash there. So parents, this is a great way to give your student cash without giving them cash or giving them a credit card because it's kind of limited what they can do with it. Um, so again, it's better to run out of your dining dollars. And because you have a campus meal plan, if you have funds in Lion Cash, we will transfer those over automatically at the register. Your student doesn't have to do anything. You get the same deep discount and you do not forfeit anything at the end of spring semester. Lion Cash carries over year to year. Um, and I also wanna make sure I mention, do not use Lion Cash for payment on campus for any food. 
use your campus meal plan. Um, some students get confused, they go to the hub, they use Lion Cash. You wanna always use your campus meal plan for anything. So let's just talk about the steps. If you haven't yet accepted that offer of mission, what does it take to become a Nittany Lion? So we want you to accept your offer of admission, obviously. So go to your My Penn State account. When you accept your offer of admission, you will also accept your housing and food service contract. After you do that, we will send you an email with a link to go into our e-living system, and that's where you'll be able to put in your contract preferences. Um, the deadline to put in preferences is, again, noon on May 15th. And then after that, um, we will uh, process a room assignment, and then we will post those in e-living um, in uh, July for you, so you know exactly where you're living and who you're living with. So I've done a lot of talking, and I hope that I answered your questions, um, but we're going to go through Q&A. But if you think of anything else, um, here is our contact information. Please feel free to reach out to us, either email, phone call, social media. Uh, we want to make sure that we answer your questions so that uh, you know uh, what to expect. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Kate. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Great presentation. Love all those pictures there and love the um, Hannah Grove in East. That is so fun. Um, all right, so let's get straight to some questions here. We've got a lot of them. First question, and I'm going to kind of double this up here. Um, are North Suites renovated and are also is South residence area renovated? Great question. So uh, yes, we renovated North. Um, they used to be traditional residence halls, and we renovated them oh, maybe the early 2000s and converted them into suites. Um, so I, I will say North is the only area that has true air conditioning, um, whereas renovated buildings are climate controlled, and there's definitely a difference between those. Um, but yeah, so th they're, they're newer, but not as new as our renovated space. We do have renovated buildings in South, but they are reserved for upper class students. So you may see that on your contract. Um, for some reason, we, it, it just uh, appears, but we're, we do not assign first year students to renovated buildings in South. All right, good to know. So how about quad rooms? Do quads typically have two bunk beds or four separate beds? Can you give us an idea of what that layout looks like? Yeah. So. Um, so one thing you'll learn about some of our buildings is they're very unique. Um, so one quad may not look like another quad. Um, so some will have four individual beds laid out and some may have one bunk bed with two individual beds and some quads can have two bunk beds. So I, and I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give you a definitive answer. Um, I will say um, in East, if we use a supplemental quad, they are four individual beds. Um, but yeah, some of the other areas, they, they do vary greatly. Um, the, those buildings that have the quads in are not cookie cutter type buildings. And so there's a lot of variety. Awesome. All right. So we've got a question here asking about uh, vaccinations prior to arrival. So um, this guest has heard that roommate selections can't be made until vaccinations are submitted before the May 15th deadline. And is this true? So um, all students are required to upload their immunization records to University Health Services, but it's not before that May 15th deadline. Um, so you should have your immunization records uploaded before you attend your orientation program. Um, students who fail to do that at some point will get a hold on their student account um, because they fail to follow you know, that requirement. Um, the university has not yet released um, a requirement for the COVID vaccination, but if you have it, when you upload your immunization records, you can include it. Um, it just has to have um, the brand and the two dates that you had uh, the shot, as well as your personal information. And from my understanding, if there's any testing requirement that's going to be implemented, if you have your vaccination uh, for COVID on record, you would be exempted from any of that requirement. Um, so again, none of this has been, um, I, I think, overly released because everything keeps changing. Um, but as we stand right now, the COVID vaccine is not required. You can upload your immunization records and include your COVID vaccination, but it's not required by uh, May 15th. So you still have more time to do that. All right. How about our residence halls co-ed? Great question. Um, yes, they are co-ed. 
So uh, we offer, um, depending on the building, um, so some buildings are single gender on a floor. So floor one might be male, floor two could be female um, because there's only one bathroom. Um, so those are our traditional residence halls. Um, some of our traditional residence halls have two bathrooms on the floor. So it's a designated male and female bathroom. Um, so half the floor could be male, half the floor could be female, but they're kind of, they're separated so that they're closer to the bathroom. In our renovated space, um, they are co-ed. Um, so one room could be two females, another room could be two males, and then maybe two more males and more females. So they're, they're um, integrated and the bathrooms are not gender specific. So any person can use any bathroom. Um, we have um, no single gender buildings um, available. They're all co-ed. We've actually found the living environment to be better when we integrate male and females together. There's less damages, which is really interesting. Um, but, um, and again, if for gender um, inclusive, uh, we will assign that person to a space where they feel most comfortable living. Awesome, great. All right, let's transition to summer. Um, can you talk about where summer students will live this summer, particularly those who are in the LEAP program? Yes, so um, we made a change um, uh, just a, a few weeks ago. So originally we were using the Pollock and South housing areas as we have traditionally used, but we are moving summer school up to East Halls. So all students attending summer session will be in a renovated residence hall for summer session. Um, so we are using the four towers buildings. Um, so that's Brumbaugh, Pinchot, Tenor, and Sproul. And uh, depending on the number of students, we could spill over into a uh, fifth or sixth building, um, but they would be all renovated spaces. Um, I will point out um, most students will have to move between summer and fall. Um, because again, we, we can't give preference to summer students to stay in a renovated space uh, versus somebody who got selected for fall. Um, so uh, if you're here for summer and fall and you would be assigned to renovated for fall, um, we're going to make sure um, that we assign you to the same room so you don't have to move. But again, the majority of students will have to move at the end of summer. Um, and so I will say, I know some students may be looking at remote classes for summer, um, so we will be sending out some information, um, hopefully by midweek next week, about if, if you do schedule summer classes that are remote, you still can live on campus. But if you opt to live at home for the summer, um, there'll be some information about what steps that you need to take. Great. Thank you. So here's a great question. Are there filtered water stations in every residence hall? Yeah, yeah. So we do offer that. Um, they're also available in um, the Commons buildings. So, you know, water, water bottle filling stations. I, I don't know what the proper name is, but yes, we do have those available. Some of our, um, the traditional halls still, they have both. There might be a filtered uh, station on the first floor or the ground floor, but the upper levels may have those um, older, uh, you know, the, the old style water uh, fountains. So you may still see both, but there are designated filling stations available all across campus. Awesome. Here's another great question too. Is it recommended to buy insurance for a student's belongings while they're living in the residence halls? Man, you guys are asking awesome questions. Right? Yeah. So um, any of your personal items that you bring, the university is not responsible for. So if there is theft, damage, you know, anything happens to it, um, we, we do not cover that. So we do recommend that you carry insurance, particularly on uh, costly items, you know, electronics, you know, TVs, your laptop, obviously. Um, so you can do that however you want. You can do that through your homeowner's insurance. You can take out a separate policy. Um, but yes, I do recommend that you may want to consider that. And we, we hear that most of those options are economical. They're not usually that high uh, costly. All right, let's see here. Um, I know you touched on a little bit about the new change for the assignment process for first year students, but can you touch on again why this process changed? Yes, yes. So um, we decided to make the change because um, we, we weren't, again, we're not able to accommodate everybody's requests. Um, we also found that uh, with roommate matching, it was very difficult to match roommates because of the different accept times. And so we were splitting up roommate requests. 
Um, so somebody that request that accepted that offer really early and they wanted renovated space, but then they put a roommate who accepted really late and would not be in renovated. Um, we couldn't put them in renovated together. And then the person who was in renovated would be moved to traditional and, you know, it just wasn't good. Um, so that was one reason. Um, the other reason was, uh, especially with the COVID pandemic, right, we are all uncertain of what lies ahead. We didn't want anybody to feel pressured into accepting the offer of admission just to get in line for housing. Um, so we wanted to relieve that pressure and allow students to really have the opportunity to explore all the different colleges and universities and make the best decision for them. Um, again, so that if they committed late, they weren't being penalized. And we also want to be mindful of um, some of our populations that do uh, tend to accept a little bit later in the process. Um, we didn't want to penalize them um, because, uh, you know, especially if they're underrepresented or they have financial concerns, um, we didn't want them to feel like they were getting the worst, I don't want to say worse, but, you know, the, not their housing preferences because they accepted late. So we wanted an even playing field for all of our students so that they all had equal opportunity to be considered for the housing option that they've listed. Makes total sense. Thank you. Who cleans the bathrooms? I'm sorry, you kind of cut out. Sorry about that. Who cleans bathrooms? Oh, yeah. So it's a mix, actually. So if it's a, I, I want to say, I'm, and I'm doing air quotes, public, meaning anybody can go into it, um, the housing operations teams, will, will, they will clean those bathrooms. If it's a bathroom that's in your room, um, they will come in on a rotating schedule to sanitize it, which means um, in between that time, you would need to clean it. Um, so uh, some students are really good at that, some not so. Um, but yeah, they will post um, a, a schedule so you know when a housing member would be entering your suite to clean that space. And they, they will post that. So it's mainly for North Suites um, but once you get into our upper class areas, um, it's the same thing. Right. Do you happen to know move-in dates for this coming uh, summer and fall semesters? Yeah, so that's a hot topic right now. So um, we are working on finalizing our arrival plan. Obviously, we're focused on summer first. Um, we expect that we can announce that within the next uh, couple weeks. So I apologize that you can't say it yet um, because there's just so many logistics um, that go into our arrival plan. It's not just housing. Um, so we're working on all of those details. Um, you can expect one day um, that will be available for students and um, uh, you can read between the lines. It'll be on a weekend. Uh, so we, we don't expect people to have to take off work. Now for fall semester, there's a lot more logistics that go into fall arrival. And uh, last year, you know, we had, um, we had to take into account uh, pre-arrival testing. Um, so that has not been announced that that's a requirement for this coming fall. So what you can expect will be um, several days of arrival and there'll be designated days for groups of students. So we'll, we'll say to first year students, uh, we want you to arrive between X date and X date and then you will have to schedule your arrival time. And that's the same for summer. You will have to go in and pre-schedule um, from our system and find a time that's available um, that works for you. And then you can arrive to campus. Again, we're working on all these logistics. Um, there's also fees that are associated with students who come early. Uh, so trying to, to work that out. So historically speaking, a uh, first year arrival is that Friday, Saturday before the semester starts. Um, but we are expecting that students will actually need to come back um, uh, maybe a couple of days before that because there will be some extended orientation programs that we will want students to attend. So um, again, we hope to have that information by June um, that we will post that. So I really do appreciate your patience. I know how hard it is, especially if you need to do travel arrangements or request off work uh, and, and we hear you. Um, it's just that, again, we have different entities that are involved with this process um, that we never had to deal with before. So we would be able to tell you, you know, I, years in advance how many, when arrival would be, but we're just not in that situation now. So uh, once it is posted, um, it will be on our arrival website site, which is arrival.psu.edu, and we'll probably do some splashes out on social media, alerting people that that information is available. Okay, great. 
Let's talk food services. We have a lot of questions in here about the difference between Lion Cash and the meal plan. Can you use Lion Cash to pay for meals in the dining commons? Um, some questions like that. It, you know, is it possible to accidentally use Lion Cash instead of your meal plan? And how do you know that happens? Can you maybe touch on those two differences? Sure. So um, your campus meal plan, you will use only on campus to pay for meals. Lion Cash, you will use on campus for laundry, um, printing, and our, some vending machines except Lion Cash. And then you use it off campus for meals. Um, so if you, um, if you go to an on campus facility, you always want to say to the cashier, meal plan. That way they press the meal plan button. If you say Lion Cash, they'll press the Lion Cash button and deduct it from your Lion Cash account. Um, last year, we did implement what we call Penn State Eats. It's an online mobile ordering app um, that was um, in play because of the, the COVID pandemic. So students could order ahead. I do expect that that app will still be available next year. So when you order your items through the app, you also can select how you want to pay, whether it be um, the meal plan or Lion Cash. So again, always pay for meals on campus with, with your campus meal plan because it's better to run out of that so you don't forfeit anything at the end of the semester. So, you know, I'm trying to look out for, for you at the end, right? We don't want to have people walk away with money on the table. So use your meal plan on campus. Make sure your student says meal plan. Um, and then when you order online, use your meal plan. And then again, Lion Cash will backfill your meal plan if you run out. Um, and Lion Cash carries over year to year as long as you're a Penn State student. Um, so you, whatever funds you put in there, you'll always have available. Whereas you, again, your campus meal plan, it ends at the end of spring semester. Awesome. Here is a great question. Can you talk about if it is permissible for students to ship items to their uh, assignment uh, for fall or I guess summer ahead of them actually moving in. Yeah, absolutely. We have a number of students who take advantage of that. Um, you know, especially if you're traveling, you, know, you can only take so much uh, on a flight. Uh, we just ask that you don't ship it more than one week before your arrival. Um, uh, many of our commons desks, we have five commons desks, one in each of the housing areas. And the commons desk is open 24 hours a day. So um, we'll, we'll be there to serve you. Um, we do have limited space. So, you know, please don't ship like 30 boxes. <laughs> uh, we might have to put it in an overflow room so that when you come, we might have to, you know, go get it. Um, but absolutely, you are able to do that. Um, your mailing address is pretty easy. Once you know your room assignment, it's your room and hall. Uh, University Park PA 16802. So our, our carriers know how to get things onto campus where they need to go. Uh, we will receive those items and we'll keep it for you until your arrival. You'll get an email that we have something and you simply go to the desk, present your ID card and uh, we'll release those packages to you. So again, feel free to ship just not more than one week before your arrival um, because uh, for the summer, not all of our desk operations are over. Um, so the carriers will have to hold it. So Absolutely, you can do that. Awesome. Okay, we still have a lot of questions here. So I, I just wanna give folks a heads up. We may not be able to answer all of these questions, um, but we'll try to stick around here so we can get some typed answers out to you at the end of this session. Um, you know what, Kate, maybe I should mention too, um, we do have um, two more webinars for first year students. Um, the webinars are, um, they, they cover many of the topics that I went over today, not anything about the meal plan. Um, it actually talks more about how to put your preferences in and what e-living looks like. So I'm gonna put this in the chat. Um, we do send out emails to students. Um, so if you haven't accepted yet, you haven't gotten the email yet. So, um, but if you haven't accepted and you're still deciding, um, I'm sorry, it says Monday the, the, the 26th and that passed, I forgot to delete that. But our next one is May 13th. Um, so you can still attend that if you want. Um, and there's the link if you want to hold on to that. Um, and again, Nick, um, he's um, in the assignment office and he'll go through that. So there's another opportunity to learn more about the housing process. Awesome. Thanks, Jennifer. 
Um, can you talk about maybe what the support system is like for students in the residence halls with, um, you know, resident assistance? And we have a question in here specifically asking about what uh, drug and alcohol enforcement looks like in those residence halls. Yeah, so we hire um, RAs, resident assistants, they're upper class students. Um, students who are RAs are uh, generally juniors and seniors. They go through a semester long um, uh, process to be hired as an RA. And then there's a huge learning or um, training component to, to teach them and train them to be your RA. Um, your RA is there for uh, mentoring, to ask uh, you know, questions. They're there to provide programming opportunities, but they're also there to enforce uh, rules and policies of the university, including the student code of conduct. Um, so uh, your RA, um, again, you, they, they should be you know, visible. You should know who they are. They'll, they'll be door tags, so you know how to contact them. Um, there's one um, pretty much on every floor, depending on the building. Uh, some of them are a little unique. And then we have residence life coordinators. Those are professional staff that we hire um, that have masters of education and they live in the buildings. Um, so your first uh, person to go to if you need help is your RA. If they can't help you, they'll involve the res life coordinator and uh, the res life coordinator will be there to mediate uh, any situation or provide guidance. And then if it needs to be escalated, there's other levels within the residence life staff to support students and help them get that through that through whatever process that may be, um, especially roommates uh, conflict. Right. Um, we would ask students to go to their RA first again and, you know, just work up that chain if there's an issue um, uh, regarding drug and alcohol enforcement. You know, we are um, obviously a drug free, alcohol free, um, dry campus, including for students who are age 21 or older. Um, so there are citations for students who get caught using either of those. Um, they could also involve university police. So if uh, somebody, um, you know, is aware of something happening in the building, um, they call, they have a, a, a protocol on how to address that. And then students could get uh, an incident report or climate, I think is what they call it. And you could be referred to the Office of Student Conduct. So um, there are consequences. Um, to some of the actions that are not uh, permissible on campus. Um, so we wanna hold students accountable. So um, again, that's kind of outlined in the terms, conditions and regulations of, of the housing and food service contract. So you can also look through those to see um, some additional information about that. But uh, you know, we look, look at this as a learning opportunity. Um, you, know, you, you are coming to a new environment. We're here to support you, to mentor you. Um, I will say to parents, um, you know, we have to, adhere to FERPA regulations. That's the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act. Um, so our contact is with your students. Uh, we are not able to share information with you uh, directly. Um, so if you call like the housing assignment office and want to know your student's room assignments, or you have a question about, do they accept the contract for next year? Uh, we cannot uh, discuss that. Our um, contract is with the student. We recognize that you may be assisting them with paying uh, for their education. Um, but legally, um, by federal regulations, we are not permitted to, to discuss anything. Um, so I, I always like to make that uh, folks aware of that. That's never a good uh, thing to, to, to have to tell people, but it is a reality of um, higher education. Makes total sense. So I think we have time for just one last question. And this question is about cable TV on campus and in the residence hall. So should students, is it recommended that students bring, um, you know, smart TVs and um, what is the cable option if there is a cable option for students um, in the residence halls? Yes, yeah, so um, a few years ago, we did a study of our students living on campus to see what the cable use was like. Um, based on that study um, and based on, um, we, we had a contract with Comcast and based on what we were hearing from Comcast, um, the use was very low. Uh, so we um, ended that contract when it expired. We did not renew it. Um, we took the funds that we were paying for cable TV and we reinvested it into the Wi-Fi service. 
Um, so uh, we um, increased uh, the, I, I don't know the technical uh, words for this, but we increased the, 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 ca the uh, capacity of Wi-Fi. So we do not offer cable TV within your residence hall room. Uh, we do still have TVs on campus that have cable TV. So in some of the lobbies, you can still watch, you know, football games in the commons buildings, you know, you can see uh, cable TV. So if you have a smart uh, TV, um, we find most students are using their um, computer or their uh, phone to stream things. So you'll be able to, to use your devices to stream. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we have our um, uh, room gear that you can use to set up the, um, the, the, um, your, all your equipment. I'm sorry, I got distracted for a second. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So we really asked you a lot of questions, Jennifer. So thank you so much for your time and uh, for joining us and for giving us all of this really great information. And thank you to the panelists who are behind the scenes answering a whole lot of questions. Uh, we really thank you for that too. We still have some questions here in the Q&A, so we'll try to get some answers out to you. But uh, you can see some information here on the screen. I would recommend visiting the housing.psu.edu website. There's a ton of information on there, a lot of great images, and you may be able to find some information on your own. Or if you have some specific questions and need to talk to Jennifer and her staff, you can send an email to office at psu.edu or email 814-865-7501, and they'd be happy to answer all of your questions. Uh, so with that, I do wanna thank you all for joining us uh, today. and. Uh, we hope that you're leaving this session with more information about on-campus housing at University Park. And uh, please stay safe and healthy. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you on campus sometime soon. Thanks so much.